Um, you know, this is a, a pretty special little Wanderback Live that we're doing this Sunday. Um, to have somebody of Robbie's skill level here accompanying us um, for this, this Sunday's chat is a pretty big deal. And to kind of put it in, into perspective for everyone, um, you know, you have, you have different varying levels of bartenders out there in the world, and we all know this, right? Like, you have your bartender that pours you your beer and puts your spirit in a glass and gives it to you and turns around and acts like they never saw you before. Um, and then you have people that are a little bit more transcendent, like Robbie, um, that are almost borderline culinary in what they're doing, and mixing their flavors with spirits and really taking a next level thought um, and a depth look at, at spirits and cocktails. Um, so I'd love to introduce Robbie and, um, you know, give us a little, a little chance to get to know you better there, Robbie. Uh, so, you know, first, you know, where are you from? How long have you been in PDX and how long have you been bartending? Um, hello, my name is Robbie Wilson. I was born and raised in San Jose, California, uh, but my parents are both from Oregon. My dad was born and raised in Corvallis, where his mother, uh, my grandmother, was a professor at Oregon State. She taught English and uh, music. She played the piano over in World War II for the military over there. I believe it was the Army. Um, my mom was mostly raised in Eugene and Springfield, but they moved down there. They actually met on an airplane and moved down there to, uh, my dad worked at Hewlett Packard. I was born there in San Jose, but it was kind of always preordained that I would come back to Oregon and, and study Oregon State. Um, I speak fluent Japanese, and so I figured I'd always do business, and kind of something in that realm. I uh, started as an accountant at uh, Yamasa Soy Sauce in Salem, Oregon, because I spoke Japanese. and uh, Realized that sitting at a desk all day long was one of the worst things I could ever come up with and that I made a horrible mistake in life. And I started helping out at my, at that time, my girlfriend's restaurant and fell in love with it. Um, I started kind of in the back of the house, but the one problem I had was that I couldn't see the reaction of the people eating the food that I was making. And I, I needed that connection. So I moved to the bar and that's where I truly fell in love with what I could do because I could be creative but there was also this social aspect and the ability to see how someone liked what you can prepare for them. And then if they didn't, you could kind of fix it on the fly. Um, and from there, just, I fell in love with the entire world of bartending. I consumed books, or YouTube videos. I can remember watching the same bartender on a YouTube video a hundred times till I could move just like him. And then it started learning kind of culinary worlds, looking at what other people were doing. I moved to Portland and, started trying to make my way in there and here I am. That's awesome. That's really ironic that, uh, that you got into accounting and then got out of accounting just like I did. Um, <laughs> it was a really fast transition there for me as well. Uh, once I kind of realized, you know, that this wasn't going to be a path that was going to uh, bring a lot of happiness and joy into my life and then kind of you know, making a quick 180 into the beverage industry, which, you know, brought so much more passion um, and so much more joy just watching people try things for the first time. You know, I think for me, before I ever got into bartending, it was, it was more the wine and food pairing thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for you, was there a certain person that got you really passionate um, when you were coming up, kind of like your first mentor? Like, I know a lot of us in the bar world have this person that taught us the ropes, right? Like, who was that guy for you in the that beginning? Actually, my ex-girlfriend, um, and one time ex-fiance, uh, she was a chef, and she never went to culinary school, but she could, I mean, this woman, her palate was incredible. That's the one thing I can, you know, without a doubt say that she has an amazing palate, and she's the kind of person who can eat a cookie and tell you how to make that recipe. Wow. How it transcended what, even my understanding of flavor rate. And that not only could she taste things, but she could tell you what something was going to be after it went through the, the heating process of that is cooking. Wow. So that was where it really started. And, and it was instead of learning how to make cocktails, like, oh, I'm going to make an old fashioned, I'm going to make a Negroni, I'm going to make a, a, a Daikiri. That wasn't how I learned to make cocktails. It was more, well, I have something that's sour. I need to balance it out with something that's sweet. And then I need to find a bridge to get that to the main personality that is the spirit. And, and I have this spice rack over here that's my bitters. I'm going to add that. And I need to dilute it this much. But now I need more texture. So I need to 
So it was this kind of playing around with textures and flavors and, and ideas more than it was trying to recreate what other people had done before me. And that's yes. what started me. And I, looking back, you know, 10 years, I've been bartending now for about 10 years. And looking back, that was definitely a, really thankful for that. Yeah, man, that's, that's an exceptional route to becoming a bartender. I mean, there's so many things there that you just said that take people years to figure out, you know. Um, it's, it's not always that fluid in the bartending world, and I feel like that's something that gets lost on a lot of consumers and customers and guests that we, we experience. They think you can just jump back there and throw things together and it's just going to work, but really it's, it's an art, and you have to be you know, really careful about how you're piecing these things together and then very mindful about the person sitting across from you and, mm-hmm. and their palate as well. Um, so botanist, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about botanist, the project that you have been working on the past few years there with Matt, um, and, and tell us a little bit about the bar, you know, your guys concept, uh, what you're passionate about there and what you're really, really trying to do. Um, and then we can get into a little bit more about the new business model that you guys have just launched that has been really successful, uh, there in Portland and helping a lot of people. Knock on wood. It's going well. Um. I, I've known Matt since Oregon State. Um, Matt and I, he was always a little bit ahead of me. He was in graduate degree, um, I believe, for business at the time when I was in my undergrad for business. And we both can't necessarily stand silence and sitting still. So we'd always end up studying in coffee shops around campus. And, you know, there's only so many coffee shops, especially what was that 15 years ago? There's your level of coffee shop isn't what people think of right now when they think of like Barista or Cova. No, so whatever, but yeah. you know, you end up hanging around these these college coffee shops with couches and chairs, and you just end up studying. But you also meet people that way, and you get to collaborate a little bit and chat. So I knew Matt for a while, and then randomly we just kept running back into each other throughout life. Whether it was bars that I worked in or restaurants that I worked in, that he'd come in and say hi, and we kept up on Facebook until one day, um, the space that is now Botanist, but formerly Pink Rose had come up and I was looking at it and I was talking to my parents about possibly investing in it and they were going, yeah, I don't know about this. I don't think so. And so I was kind of racking my brain about what am I going to do? Where am I going to find funding for this project? And Matt was sitting at the bar at at the time I was working at Urban Farmer in the Nines Hotel as a manager there and went up to him and as a joke, he was, now granted, he'll tell the story and it's very true. He was halfway through a bottle of wine and I think I had served him at least one or two cocktails before that. So, you know, buzz decisions, buzz business decisions, um, said, hey, how do you feel about opening a bar together? And he kind of just took a one minute to think about it and said, sure, why not? Text me, you know, call me tomorrow, let's set up a meeting and chat about it. We sat down and chatted and that has always just been kind of our business relationship is we get into it and we chat and we find these solutions. And it's, it's been an up and a down roller coaster of one, just running and operating a restaurant in Portland, Oregon in a bar but two now going with COVID and whatnot, but you know, ultimately we, we clash and we find a solution and that's where I think our relationship really, really works well. And uh, awesome. the idea of botanist was, I had grown up in, in cocktail bars and I have very limited experience with clubs and very limited experience with dive bars, as much as I, I love going to myself, I hadn't really much, very little experience with actually, <laughs> but, I love going into them. I love going into like your neighborhood dive bar and how friendly people were and how just nonchalant casual it was. And I wanted to open a cocktail bar. I kind of, I couldn't understand why cannot a cocktail bar not be so fun and friendly like these, these dive bars, whereas most of the cocktail bars I was going to, they were very proper. If I'm going to be politically correct on it, they were very proper. They were very about, you know, hospitality and service. And, and I kind of, you know, drinking is fun. It's not meant to be so manicured. It's meant to be a little raunchy. It's meant to be a little crazy. And so I wanted to open a bar that embodied that and really great culinary arts, cocktails included, but also a really great place to hang out and enjoy friends and family and, and social gatherings, which sadly we don't have that ability so much anymore. But that was the idea behind it. Um, then COVID-19 hit and we obviously had to shut down, but we, that wasn't a good enough answer for us was to just furlough and get back to, and sit at home and do nothing until our thumbs. So 
Well, you guys, you guys quickly transitioned. It was a very, very fast transition from, you know, a lot of places not knowing what to do and shutting down to all of a sudden botanist has this idea that, and props to you guys, it looked like you've been doing it for years. You know, that was a very, very smooth transition as opposed to kind of what we've all seen from, you know, the general populace. It was, it was very good. Well, thank you. Uh, it, it was stressful to say the least. Uh, sure. but yeah, Tuesday, we uh, had our last day of business and I believe it was Wednesday. We all sat downstairs and said, what do we want to do? And the idea of doing free meals for the service industry and not knowing what was going to happen and stuff. So we immediately launched that. And, uh, Matt's very much kind of let's just do it kind of guy and we'll worry about everything else later. And so we launched this thing and then we went, well, shoot, how are we going to get funding? And that was my job, which as much as I hated it, it was back in the business and trying to get funding from different charities. So reaching out to everybody, which I was in competition with everybody and anyone doing just that. The bartending guild, other charities, etc. So then immediately when Um, that distilleries can um, distilleries can start to deliver, and Matt, being the business genius that he is, and and kind of more of a supply chain master than I am, and it kind of said and pointed out immediately that that just is stupid. There's no distillery in town that has the supply chain necessary to deliver alcohol. That's that's quite crazy, and to expect them to be able to do that is is just silly, and not cost them more than it's going to let them make. Yeah. So we applied for a third party delivery license immediately and we got it. And then we started offering to all the distilleries, Hey, we'll deliver for you. That $10 fee that you're allowed to charge. We'll take that. That will help pay for our drivers who were out delivering charity food anyway. And we needed a, a way to pay them. So we'll do this instead. And it, since there it's just snowballed with at your door and getting distilleries on board. And now it's the, the cocktail kit collaborations and hopefully bringing on other restaurants and all kinds of stuff. So, it's, it's a scary new world, but at the same time, I, I'm, I'm very happy to know that we're partnered with a bunch of really amazing, smart, intelligent, and just hardworking people here in Portland, Oregon, and, and the surrounding area to be able to do this. That's phenomenal. I mean, yeah, Portland, I mean, I knew there was a way that somebody was going to come in and kind of lead the charge because it's such a tight-knit community, you know, first and foremost, I feel like between everybody there. It's a small town, less than a city, you know? At least that's how I feel. Um, I mean, the number of cities that I've lived in, um, Tokyo, um, San Jose, and here, the mentality of I'm going to help you succeed and you're going to help me succeed is really a Portland thing. And from what is. I don't see that kind of community help and outreach coming from other cities necessarily. You go to the bigger cities and it's very competitive. It's not, no, I'm going to succeed. You get out of my way. If you can't get with me, I'm going to step on you. Like kind of mentality where here it's like, no, 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 no. It's not enough for me to succeed by myself. I have to succeed with the community. I have to succeed with everybody. And it's that long-term vision that really, really made me fall in love with this city. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why the Northwest is such a special place. You know, I feel like that mentality is pretty common out here. Yeah. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. I agree. Speaking of beautiful things, let's, uh, let's get into the cocktail making. Maggie, are we looking, looking good on people? Give me the thumbs up if we're looking good on... Yeah. Awesome. Right. Let's get to it. So I believe I believe the uh, the first cocktail we're going to make here is a uh, batch number one old fashioned. Correct. Uh, and so, oh, I'm going to let you go, Robbie. You you lead it through it. All uh, right. Well, uh, a batch number one here is a uh, pretty rare product, if you will. Um, there's not a whole lot of it out there anymore. You know, to be to be frankly honest, I think we've got like 10 cases left in Oregon State, and that's about it, floating around between liquor stores out there. And that's kind of the whole premise of this company is we're producing uh, limited release, uh, small quantity batches of the whiskey that we make. Um, so batch number one is the first whiskey we produced um, and put out there for all of you uh, about three years ago. Um, and it is literally a three-year-old single malt whiskey just aged in brand new American oak with a char level one and a high toast on the inside of the barrel. 
Um, we distilled this with Westland up in Seattle, one of the premier single malt producers in the country right now for America. They're kind of leading the charge, if you will, for everybody as far as quality and consistency and, and what people can really expect from this movement uh, from single malt. So the fact that Phil was able to partner with them first off is a really huge first step. Absolutely. And, and for me, so I'm, you know, being a bartender and also at the same time, I, I view myself as an artist. My job is to create liquid art that you can then consume and enjoy it. Um, one of the things I have a really hard time with is it's in this day and age, it's so easy to just make a quick buck. You know, Cody, if you and I wanted to go start our own whiskey brand, it wouldn't be that hard to do. No. We need an investor for, you know, maybe 10 to $50,000. Most of that money would honestly go to marketing and some of it would go to buying a barrel from somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. Um, MGP. And, yeah, and shipping it over here and, and bottling it and slapping labels on it and calling it a day. And we could put as much work into that as just saying, I, I, whatever, I, I want a good whiskey or it could be into like, oh, well, you know, I want a high rye bill or I want this. And so it's incredibly hard for a new distillery to get up and going. It's incredibly expensive. It's inc and not just expensive. I mean, stills are, if you want to think about buying, you know, a mansion, that's a still at the end of the day. And that's if you can get someone to make it for you. Whiskey stills from in, coming from Scotland are not available to buy just off the market. They have to be made custom for you. And most of those Scotch distilleries are, are the, the makers of those stills won't just make them for you. So it's an incredibly time and labor and money endeavor to create a whiskey. And you guys, I think kind of chose the best route you could possibly do to, for an upstart whiskey company and partnering with people and, and going there and, and working with them in a collaboration to create something truly unique and truly special. So it's, it's your artistic input as well as some, another expert's ability to make. And I, I find that in this day and age when we have a lot of, um, just marketing money put into random things. There's a lot of authenticity to that. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. So batch number one, in honor of that authenticity, we're going to create something super simple. Um, two ounces of batch number one. And then I have a little bit of rich Demerara. You can buy it at, at your door on the botanist side, or you can make it yourself. Um, it's a bit of a pain in the ass, but I'm going to do what is two bar spoons of that or roughly a quarter ounce. Um, Demerara, if you think about it on, if you think about sugar, it's on a spectrum. Over here on one side, you have white and brown sugar, which is beyond chemically just taken apart. There's nothing but just the sugar taste itself, which is just sweet. There's nothing else to it. And then on the other extreme side, you have um, Demerara and Muscovado. Muscovado being super raw. There's not much um, to that at all. It's just raw sugar that's been boiled down. It has mm -hmm. all the molasses in there. And you have Demerara, which is slightly more processed, but the molasses for the most part is kept in there. And that's gonna give you these wonderful vanilla notes, these wonderful caramel notes. And that's, I mean, that's what you're getting, those are the notes you're getting from the barrel. So we're really showing off the barrel flavor. I have some of PDX's aromatic bitters, I'm trying to keep it local if possible. I like mine to be a little more bitter, so I'm gonna use three full syringes, if you would, of that. Now, just do a quick little stir. I like to taste things as I go. Mm. And, and a quick question for you there, Robbie. Um, when you are making your simple syrup, and I know this is kind of something that's preference-based, but do you prefer to go a ratio of two to one water to sugar or one to one water to sugar? I prefer two to one. Uh, I have two reasons. One. When you have stirred cocktails like this, there's a thinness. And having a thicker, simple syrup is going to increase the complexity in your mouth. It's going to increase that, that texture. And two, there's less water. I am by no means an expert, but I do understand that when you're diluting something, you have multiple things affecting it. You have the humidity in the air, you have the temperature, you have the amount of bodies in a room. There's a lot going to play in this. If I'm adding water to it, I have even less room for that dilution to happen. Absolutely. But with a two to one, there's more sugar to more water. I can add less, one, less of the actual ingredient itself for more sweetness, but I'm also adding less water to the overall cocktail. 
So I just have more room for my own, what I want to do. And I can sit here and I can think about it. I can get it to the proper chill level and I can get it to the proper dilution without outside influences that I didn't think about, like just the overall simple syrup. I'm gonna strain this out into a nice little rocks glass. And then I, I think oranges are wonderful. I think you definitely should use one, but I have a lemon at home here. So I'm gonna use a little bit of lemon for a little bit more added acidity. I'm a bit of what you would know as a wino, and therefore I love acid. And the lemon really brings that out. I mean, traditionally you see orange used with old fashions a lot, but as a former bartender myself, I felt disappointed most of the time when I would be using orange pith rather than lemon because the brightness wasn't quite there that you usually get with the lemon, personally. And for bourbon, coming from Kentucky and coming, because I mean, bourbon's gonna be really, really rich, right? And you have that concentration of flavor and that's coming from both like what bourbon is from its mash bill, the corn, the rye, the barley, but also it's coming from the fact that Kentucky is, excuse my French guys, but it's hot and humid as fuck. And so you're gonna get a lot of evaporation of that liquid. So a lot of concentration. And depending on where those barrels are housed in the storeroom, they're either gonna evaporate the water faster, the higher they are in the storehouse, the more water evaporates out, versus when they're lower in the storehouse and you're having the alcohol evaporate out first. So if you've ever wondered why you can get bourbons at 130 proof when they're legally not allowed to enter a barrel higher than 125, that is why. There's a weird reaction that happens at the top of a warehouse. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's but, a little bit drier rather than humid. So the water is the thing that evaporates. The alcohol stays. Exactly. And as producers and distillers, we have to kind of plan for that. You know, our, our ABV then kind of goes upwards rather than downwards. Yep. Uh, but with the bourbons, you get these, and plus it's new American oak, so you're getting these hyper-concentrated flavors. And there, an orange is fantastic. But when you're dealing with single malt, and when you're dealing with things that are a little bit younger, a little more elegant, you're getting more of like the base notes of what the base spirit is coming right off the still, aged in oak for a couple of years. You want something a little bit brighter and not so heavy and dense like an orange. You want maybe a lemon. And so personally, that's why I went with this. Well, that's what we call a professional, folks. <laughs> <laughs> not a professional. And then, uh, and then one more thing here, Robbie, as well. Um, the Old Fashioned is a cocktail that has evolved so many different times over the years, right? Like you just made what I consider to be the classic, or I mean the, the modern day, I guess I should say, appropriate version because we're making whiskeys and spirits right now that are meant to taste so good that you can drink them neat. But that wasn't always the case. And so there, there may be different variations of old fashions out there. You know, you see people crushing cherries and orange peel of slices and lemons um, with ice and then topping them with soda and dumping bitters in there on top of a sugar cube, all sorts of different things. Um, but could you, could you speak a little bit about how that, that cocktail has kind of evolved? Because a lot of people, you know, when they ask for an old fashioned, it's, it's almost like the martini. They have an idea in their head of what this should be, but not necessarily every bartender understands what that idea might have been that they had, you know, in the, in the first place. And I mean, the old fashioned, uh, talk about a history, weird history jump. So the, the old fashioned is the original cocktail, but it was not called the old fashioned, it was called the cocktail. <laughs> if you look up in a dictionary what a cocktail is, by definition, it is spirits, sugar, bitters, and water. That is its definition at its base. Because you have to remember the cocktail was coming out in the early 1800s, and ice was not a thing. And so to make a cocktail, you mixed it with, you know, cold, fresh water, some sugar, and some bitters, and you had some, some spirit. At the time, you had brandy and gin and rum. Um, American bourbon was not really much of a thing in, originally. Um, it's not that it wasn't around, it's that no one held it in high regard. When you were importing things from Scotland and Ireland, and that, at that time, the whiskey of choice was Irish whiskey. Um, it was considered to be much, much better than the, um, the Scottish version. Mm -hmm. uh, you had gin and you had rum. Rum was truly, especially in like the American spirit of things, rum was there. People really associated and enjoyed rum. Yeah. Um, it really kind of embodied the value of what it meant to be an American. It, it, um, the daiquiri used to be a huge deal, you know. 
And then moving forward, you know, after the 1920s and into Prohibition, rum was the thing because that's what was closest to us. We had rum runners coming in from the islands, Puerto Rico, Cuba, vice versa. If you had money, you were going on a vacation in Cuba. That was the thing, or on cruise boats. And so that's kind of where that came from. But then all of a sudden bourbon came out and it was always there, but it was starting to be made well. It was starting to be aged properly. And you had that age coming from supposedly the Mississippi. You had people making things in Kentucky. And then the only way to ship things were, were to put them in barrels and send them on the way down the Mississippi on barges where they would end up in New Orleans. Uh, and that's where they were really truly enjoyed. And people noticed that the best bourbon came from New Orleans. And finally, someone figured that out, but that wasn't because New Orleans was a magical place, which granted it is. Um, it was simply that it was the end of the road. And so the bourbon, the barrels hit there and it had been aged the maximum that it was going to be. And then people started paying attention to the, how the barrels were, because if you think back then, how do you form a barrel? Here we have machines and we have, you know, hydraulics and whatnot. You can bend the wood. But back then you had to heat the wood up so it was pliable. And in, when you heated it up, you made mistakes and you burned it a little bit. And so you have these barrels and sometimes the inside, you know, one or six pieces would be charred and some one and whatnot. And people started paying attention to which barrels produced the best bourbon. They started seeing that the char on the inside, the most charred barrels were the good ones. And so that's where that char level started that we talked about. That's beautiful. Happy mistakes, as they say. <laughs> There's always, there's always something that comes out of a mistake. Right. And then, uh, and then speaking of rum, our uh, second cocktail uh, that we're going to make for you today uh, is with batch number two uh, from Wander Back here. Uh, so this is a whiskey that after three years of aging in that virgin American oak with the char level one and the high toast, uh, we then moved it into ex-bourbon casks uh, for about six months. And then it spent another six months finishing in ex Nicaraguan rum casks. Uh, and really it just, it's like a gateway into um, single malt whiskey for bourbon drinkers, if you will. That sweetness imparted by the rum that it's extracted from the barrels uh, works beautifully. The rum that was produced is in a drier style, it seems like. So those drier qualities of batch one, you know, follow through all the way. Um, but you just incredible fruity tropical notes off of it that it makes it a fun whiskey to pair and a fun whiskey to mix with. And this is probably one of my favorite whiskeys that you guys have made. Um, it's one of my favorite scotches of all time is going to be the Balvini 14 uh, year old Cuban cask. I think it's just a wonderful entry level, easy sipping scotch. You can do whatever you want with it. And then this came out and I was like, wow, this is that different close and it's just along the same lines it's beautiful it's elegant it's got all the wonderful notes that i want from rum but everything i want from a great you know single malt whiskey and so when i'm thinking about this i thought well let's make the two simple co simplest cocktails one so people at home can make them but also because that's how you show off a really great spirit is you make simple things you know don't don't muddle it with just too much um, and so i'm trying to think what am i going to do with this a manhattan would be wonderful but let's let's switch it up again and then we have these wonderful rum notes and if you think of rum one of the things that you just always compare with rum that's wonderful is sherry and sherry we could sit here and we could talk for the next three years about sherry because it's so interesting but i have some uh oloroso sherry so it's a sweeter style sherry you can break into more or less two quadrants you have floor and you have no floor now floor is spelled f-l-o-r floor is a mold it's a um, think like blue cheese and if you have it you'll have the barrels so imagine that this is a barrel you have the floor will grow over the top of the sherry and what that does is not only does it impart these wonderful floral notes but it also keeps it from oxidizing so you have very delicate cherries and those can be aged or unaged for the most part and then you have non floor which is going to be oxidized so you get these wonderful uh, nutty notes these caramel marzipan orange marmalade, things like that, which to me, that's what I want to pair with a really great single malt that's kind of in the realm of uh, rum as well. So oh, I'm, and sherry and single malt, you know, have a very deep relationship when you think about producers out there that are aging their single malts in ex-sherry casks. 
Like that's arguably probably one of the most popular X barrels out there for people like us at the moment. Um, so much so that those barrels have become so expensive that people in Spain have started just dumping the sherry into the streets and selling the barrels. Yep. Um, depending on the Scotch distillery, if you go with say Macallan, Macallan is uh, wealthy enough that they have their own sherry producer in Spain. And so what they do with that is they literally make sherry that it's for the sole purpose of those barrels. Uh, now, granted, if you talk to say uh, the distiller for Glen Morangi and Ardbeg, he'll tell you that the sherry is a cheat. If you want to cover up all the mistakes you made in distillation, use a sherry barrel. But if you want the true flavor of something, you want a bourbon barrel. I'll let them get into it. I don't. <laughs> I, I both make wonderful whiskeys. I think that they're just a little bit different. To me, the bourbon barrel gives a little more, more delicacy and elegancy. The sherry gives just this wonderful, rich dessert almost. Yeah. I feel like that's an argument that I have no business putting my nose in the middle of, honestly. Well... One of those arguments that can go on to the end of time and the people that actually benefit from it are you and I because we just get to drink the results of it. Exactly. So we have this wonderful cocktail in here. We're gonna give it a quick stir. And so this is uh, just whiskey, bitters, and sherry, correct? And this one was all the for. Um, Oloroso is going to be your, your kind of, it's sweet, but it's not as sweet as, say, sweet vermouth. If you want something like that, you're going to look for Pedro Jimenez or PX. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be much richer and much sweeter. When you get to PX, what they do actually is they create um, almost like a grape juice, a reduced grape juice, and they add that back to it to create more sweetness. Where Oloroso is, for the most part, getting its sweetness just from the barrel. Um, it's much more aged. There is no floor in Oloroso. So you also get these wonderful um, oxidization notes, which for me with sherry specifically, it's nuttiness, but it's also brine, there's salt to it. It's almost, it doesn't taste peanutty, but if you taste the peanut, there's a salt quality to many peanuts. And I think that's wonderful, especially with a cocktail, there should always be a little salt. I agree. That's why I uh, enjoy drinking cocktails like this with oysters. Personally, if you were gonna go that route, it's a fantastic pairing, very eye-opening. It is. Um, whiskey and oysters in general, especially like younger ones, super good. And the other weird one, if you ever get a chance, take like a really peaty smoky one and do it with creme brulee. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna have to try that. <laughs> Here we have kind of Manhattan-esque. Beautiful. Tell me what you're tasting. You're kind of making me jealous over there, Robbie. I'm not gonna lie. What I love about this, so me, I, I have a fairly dry palate. I don't like sweet things, specifically in drinks. I like them in my solids. I like my cookies and my cake. But this is elegant and sweet. It's not sweet. It's elegant. There's a lot going on. For me, this is perfect. I think for someone else who maybe needs a little bit more sweetness, you could add a little bit of dem to it, just maybe one bar spoon, and that would bring up the sweetness for you. But to me, this is perfect. Excellent. That's a really good uh, perception there. I get the barrel, I taste the whiskey, I taste also that rum quality to it. And then I get all these wonderful nutty notes and all this like bright, sweet orange and Mars band flavors. Very nice. Maggie, do we have any uh, questions from the gallery here for Robbie yet? We do, I was just about to interject, but I didn't want to interrupt. Um, we do have a question. Somebody was wondering um, if they were to start their own home bar, if you have any tips and how you can be prepared for that and any good starters. Any good starters. Um, if you are starting from zero, then you get to have a lot of fun and spend a lot of money. Um, <laughs> easiest thing you need to look for, I would go to Cocktail Kingdom. Um, great shakers, great mixing glasses. You need uh, a shaker, you need a bar spoon, you need a strainer. I highly recommend a double strainer just for um, your shaken drinks if you don't like ice cubes in them. And I already said a mixing glass spoon, and there you go. I would also get maybe something Jigger. to measure Jigger. Need a jigger. Yeah, something to measure things in. Yep. Um, and there you go. That's your basic home bar setup. It's fine. Then when you want to get crazy, there are things out there that are uh, very nice, very elegant. Um, the world is the same as a chef knife. You can buy a knife for 20 bucks 
at Fred Meyer and it's, it's works that cuts things. And then you can turn around and you can go buy a Japanese 62 layer Damascus beauty and it will cut things like butter no matter what it is. Same in the world of cocktails. You can buy shakers that are, I think you can get a shaker from like bartools.com for a total of five bucks and shipping probably a little more than that. Or you can go online and you can get crazy ones like this that are solid silver. Um, so they're yeah. fun. If you want to spend the money, trust me, it's there. Um, if you don't, if you just want to get by with what you need to start making cocktails at home, just go to Cocktail Kingdom. You'll spend hundred bucks and you'll have your full kit and it will last you for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, Cocktail Kingdom is like one of those secrets of the industry. I feel like that a lot of the public doesn't quite know about, you know, and it's really the first place that I look anytime I'm looking for something, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to make something the right way, the first place I look is Cocktail Kingdom, whether it's, uh, you know, an atomizer or it's a craft or it's an, a nice spoon with a cool pineapple on the top of it. I mean, that's, that's where we go. Um, but it's a very, very kind of unknown thing, I think, out there in the industry that's good for other people to look at. And if anybody on this video is, is watching this and now going on to Cocktail Kingdom, be forewarned, you are about to spend some money. <laughs> you, you can't walk off that site without doing it. And the worst thing is, you be like, I need this. Exactly. <laughs> I, I before, but I, now I need it. I need to know how to make, you know, ice cubes that are going in my Collins glasses. I... I need this. Yeah, they do too good of a job. And then the books that they supply on there as well, like the old school books, like the, uh, I forget, uh, Harry Thomas, or yeah, Harry Thomas, I believe, uh, one of his first cocktail books is out there. Uh, and they just do a phenomenal job of education, you know, in the public. It's, it's a cool site. Yeah. Um, a lot of great books. And for me, so Cocktail Kingdom is about as old as I am with bartending. And originally when they got started, what they were doing is they were importing Japanese bar tools. There's a wonderful website out there called naranja.jp. Um, naranja being orange in Spanish. I don't know why they chose that one, but it is a juggling balloon and bartending site. You can choose which one you go to. Um, I believe they have an English version, or if not, Google will translate it for you, but there's more bar tools than you could ever think exist, exist there. And wow. what Cocktail Kingdom was doing was more or less importing the ones that they thought were cool off that. And then there's wow. a couple of other uh, German ones that they were on there as well. And then they started making their own. So they basically were the Costco of it. They imported it. They learned what it was. They chose what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. And then they created their own. And that's, it's been really cool and fun to kind of watch them grow in the industry as much as all of us have. Nice. Hey, we just had a really good question come through uh, asking about your um, portions for your Manhattan. Um, I know a lot of people have, you know, like two to one or two and a half to three quarter ratio, but um, what is it that you use for your spirit uh, to vermouth, vermouth or vermouth substitute and then bitter component um, there? So for me, I love, um, always start with the classic recipe of two to one because you're thinking that you want something that's strong. And I like to look at things in, in first of all, parts. So don't think of it necessarily as two ounces, one ounce. That I look at it as, okay, we have, two, we have two parts and we have one part. Cool, that's perfect, let's start there. And then we have some bitters. Think of bitters as not only your spice, but also the balance between that sugar. Because we're not using a, a syrup per se to have something that's super sweet, but we're using a fortified wine that has some sweet element to it. Whether it's just, that's naturally how it is, or they've added sugar to create that. Um, from there, Modify to your own preference. For me, I really like two to one for my, my Manhattans, whereas I, my martinis, I like a little bit drier. If I'm doing a nice gin, I like two ounces and a quarter of gin to about three quarter ounce of vermouth and three dashes of orange bitters. Whereas a Manhattan, if I'm going to do a three quarter ounce of vermouth, then usually I'm adding an Amaro or some other bitter in there to kind of fortify that vermouth as well. Nice. Absolutely. Uh, Maggie, you have anything else out there from the gallery that uh, needs answering? We do. Um, so I know you guys just tasted and made cocktails with our batch one and two. Um, we don't want to leave batch three out. Uh, Robbie, do you have a, it sounds like you're a fan of batch two, but we're wondering if 
over here if you've ever tried batch three and Cody, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more to those who don't know what batch three is. Um, and if there's a favorite out of all three that you have. Um, batch three is wonderful. I think it's taking what you learned with batch one and two and combining into something new. And it's, it's batch three is where I, I'm getting really excited to see what the future of Wonderback is. Um, yeah, and uh, for everybody out there that um, hasn't experienced what batch three is yet, that is our latest release that we put out last fall. It's a uh, five-year whiskey uh, that we finish in export casks. Um, for a very short amount of time, you know, it's, it's a different kind of take on a finishing barrel. Rather than wanting to allow a lot of those flavors that are coming in from that X casks to take over and uh, really manipulate the whiskey, we were just looking for a slight enhancement, you know. So our whiskey really only spends six to eight weeks finishing in those barrels to get a little bit of a, a pick-me-up, if you will. Um, and, and what it did was, was beautiful. It, didn't, it really enhanced the flavors that were already there. And then it added in a couple other little things like the red dried fruits that made our whiskey, you know, phenomenal batch three. Everybody so far really loves that one. I think you see a lot of people on the fence as to whether they like batch one or batch two the most, but then batch three, the general consensus is everybody likes it. It's easy, easy to like. Yeah, it's, um, when you're making a cocktail, we have, you know, a lot of ingredients to play with, but, and the cool thing is we have a lot of cultures that we get to play with, right? We have, with a bartender, there's, there's, you walk this line of, you have to give uh, honor and due respect to the products that you work with, but you also have to be kind of a vagabond and kind of say, screw tradition and screw what you're all about. I'm going to make it into something new and, and unique. But Sadly, the one tool we can't really play with is time because we kind of have to crank up those cocktails as fast as we can. But with a distiller, you have the opportunity to not only play with all the things that I mentioned that I played with earlier, cultures and heritages and ideas from all over the world, but you also have the ability to play with time. <laughs> time is an amazing ingredient and it, it does amazing things. And so you take these flavors and you can decide, okay, I want this to spend six weeks in this barrel because it's going to impart this, but I'm going to do two months in this barrel or I'm going to do this. And, and so to me, that's, that's where the whiskey world is really at right now is playing with time and playing with what that time is all about in whether you're aging it in a barrel that's held something else previously, it's a new barrel. Um, what is the, where is the wood for that barrel coming? Is it American oak? Is it French oak? I think that's a, a huge playground for whiskey to absolutely i mean there's there's so many different variables a lot of them we've kind of tried to break down into different segments on these sunday wanderback live talks um <clears throat> but the west coast is a very exciting place to be right now because i feel like there's a lot of people out here that are really doing it right you know and that's that's a, a big, big thing, um, especially in this country where the West Coast was the last place to kind of be developed in this country. So um, for things like single malt whiskey to show up and start thriving here is really exciting. And distillery and breweries, you know, breweries out here, the craft brewing scene on the West Coast is so different than it is on the East Coast. And if you think about it, that's the foundation of whiskey is the brewing scene because all whiskey starts as beer, you know maybe without the hops, but it all starts somewhere. And so for our culture out here on the West Coast to be so progressive and um, exploratory and to see the quality and the passion behind it from everybody, uh, it's, it's really special. It's a special place to be. I agree. And I think I'm hoping to see that the West Coast becomes the birth ground for the next stages of the still spirit, specifically whiskey. Um, I really look forward to seeing what happens when you have brewmasters talking to distillers about what yeast they're using, um, how are they malting it. Uh, I think one of the coolest things to follow for us who love spirits is there's a wonderful distillery out of Copenhagen called Empirical Spirits. Mm -hmm. I think we can all learn a little bit from them. They're using koji. Koji is a rice mold that turns the starch to sugar. Um, they're using that to malt their barley and create a whiskey style out of that. And you know that idea of whiskey and and single malt kind of has always had it easy because there's an enzyme within barley that does that naturally. 
And mm -hmm. so once you let it go, it, it goes to town. And if you look at like bourbons, bourbons that have 10% barley or more are going to be able to organically allow themselves to malt and thereby converting those starches into sugars. Whereas anything below that, you have to push a starter in there. And most starters are fairly aggressive. So this idea of creating new enzymes or enzymes that can break those starters and create new flavors, super excited to it. And now we have new still technology coming out so you can really choose what flavors you're getting and stuff like that. The, the science and the, the, the creativity and the art behind it is, is truly becoming amazing. Yeah, it's finally coming together. Just imagine where we'd be if we never had prohibition. <laughs> Every country's gone through it at least once. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> we do have another question. Um, is there a certain cocktail that you like to make the most or that's your favorite in general? Um, I have a, so to be perfectly honest and, and to kind of throw myself under the bus, I don't make cocktails at home very often for myself. In fact, it's taken um, a shutdown for me to start making cocktails at home for my, my fiance and myself. And um, I love stirred cocktails, anything stirred, whether it be a Negroni, a Manhattan. To me, there's an elegance behind that that I really, really love. Um, a daiquiri, I love daiquiris. I love gimlets. And for me, I love honey. So bee's knees, anything with honey, and I love. And, and living in the Pacific Northwest, we have access to some of the most amazing honey in the world. And so being able to throw different types of honey in a, uh, a bee's knees of sorts, whether it be rum, gin, vodka, whiskey, it, it's really, really fun. Right. Cody, do you have a favorite that you like to make? You know, the more and more we talk here, the more I realize how similar Robbie and I are. <laughs> even, even as a bartender back in the day, you know, when you've made 300 plus cocktails in a night, it's really hard to come home and like want to make yourself a cocktail. Um, I feel like for myself, I gravitate a little bit more towards the craft beer scene when I'm drinking at home. Um, but if I am going to be doing anything, you know, it's, it's probably the same thing, making something for my fiance that's like a daiquiri. Uh, that's what she drinks, margaritas. Um, when I was bartending, I took very special pride in uh, making a very a scratch margarita or, and a scratch Bloody Mary. Um, that's how I would really kind of try to put my stamp on things. Doing something that would be hard for you to recreate with a mix, put it that way, and then put people on a twist when they'd go home because they couldn't make it again. Nice. Yeah, uh, been there. It's yeah. <laughs> Anything else there, Maggie? I think we're uh, getting pretty close to our time here. We're getting close, yeah. And I think just a final question that I have, just I'm really more, I want to go back to the botanist and what do you miss the most about the restaurant and bar scene and what's your favorite part about it in general? And how is the whole turn on going on to at your home and how that's all playing out the biggest challenges you've seen? Um, I admit, I think my sous chef said it best uh, a couple of weeks ago. She misses botanist just being a bar and I am hundred percent with her. I miss it being just a bar and being able to go in there and to, to think of going back, you know, two months from today and go, Oh, there's no big worry. It's just a bar. I'm going to show up. I'm going to put my apron on. I'm going to make cocktails and laugh with people and make jokes. And, and then I'm going to clean up and I'm going to go home. And now to walk into what is, I, we call the war room. It's, it's a little sad. We have posters everywhere with, you know, writing on it and goals and, and, you know, routes for each driver to go on and what they need to deliver with that route. And, you know, does that, we're delivering, you know, 700 meals a day. So within those 700 meals, there's every food allergy you can imagine. There's, there's dietary restrictions, there's preferences, you name it. And so just, you know, you have every route up and, you know, there's a couple stars on those routes, but, oh, I can't, I can't have wheat. Cool, we have gluten-free on this route, be careful. Um, this one has this dietary restriction. Oh, be careful, don't let that touch this. So it's, it's its own challenge, it's a lot of fun, but it's no longer just a bar. Right. So. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, but it's fun. It's doing something. And, uh, and both myself and my business partner, Matt, are, are people that can't sit still. Yeah. Very easily. I think I'd truly be going absolutely insane right about now if we did not have at your door and did not have botanists' charity meals to, to wake up to every day and to plan it out. So I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful for our team that we have pushed to the absolute breaking point and back seven, several different times now and they still are together and we, we still laugh and, and find times to enjoy each other's company and tease each other and have a good time and, and get through this all together. Yeah. And I and think it's also provided the opportunity to meet all you guys, which I don't think that I would have had the, the drive nor the, the pleasure to get to know you guys all on this level and this ability to actually speak to distillers and really truly get to know people and to take a passion that I have for teaching and, and sharing and, and talking about. It's, it's really fun. And I, it's kind of allowed me to see one of the biggest gaps that I see in the industry right now is the difference between what people are doing and people able to being able to consume that artistry. You know, in, in, in other artistry worlds, we have art appreciation classes and whatnot, but there is no culinary appreciation class. And so as chefs and distillers and brewers and winemakers get more and more advanced in their technique, the gap between what they're doing and what people understand they're doing keeps growing. And I think that now we all have a chance to sit back and go, no, let's, let's really appreciate what they're doing and the artistry behind it. And, explain to the average person like you can be excited about this because this is what they're doing and this is the art that they're involved in and it's really cool and it's okay to be excited about that and it's okay if you don't get it you can learn to appreciate it or you can go in another direction and appreciate music or film or whatever yeah art. i mean that's an incredible point that you just made right there i mean i feel like as a culture in america the last 40 years the gap between what was able to be done at home and what you would expect when you go out has just widened big time. You know, you see all of these celebrity chefs and amazing bartenders and you go out as a guest and as a consumer and you're like, how the hell did you do that? You know, but before all of that, like all of these things were pretty much being done in the home, uh, especially bartending. You know, you used to see that in the 1950s and 60s, like, people understood what a Vesper and all of these classic cocktails were um, in their home to some degree and they could make them. And now, you know, it's like, what are we doing in our lives without Robbie? <laughs> yeah. And I think that goes along the lines where you are giving people the chance to actually learn and make these cocktails at their home with your co cocktail to go kits and, us getting to get to know you and collaborate on that has just been a really awesome experience for us as well. So thank you for making this an, a great opportunity for all of us. Absolutely. Thank you, Robbie. Cheers for joining us. Cheers. Thank you for guys. Cheers. Yeah. Again, for anyone who missed it, um, Robbie is from botanist and they now have an online site um, called at your door where you can order. What is it, Robbie? Is it, all food and drinks and cocktail to go kits now and all we're, the good stuff that Portland has to offer. Getting there. We're, we have spirits. Uh, quite a few breweries just jumped on board and are live now. There's a couple wineries uh, ready to be onboarded fairly soon. And then the next goal is to have uh, food. And so things like, you know, fingers crossed, blue star donuts and uh, provisions and things like that will be available on well. And the idea is that, how do we provide the restaurant experience to somebody at home? And so the, it started from that of going, okay, well, can we, you walk into a restaurant, you have wine, you have beer, you have spirits, you have food, you have all these things being provided. Um, how can we provide that to someone's door? And so we gave them basically a digital farmer's market that you can go in and go from booth to booth to booth, choose what you want. And then hopefully we can interest you in pairing that with, a uh, cocktail kit or a nice, uh, some wonderful veggies grown from a local, you know, farmer or, you know, a nice slab of beef from Mickey USA or, you know, something like that. And we can talk about pairing and stuff like that. And then the ultimate goal is then education. So you take all those things that you bundle from what it means to be an Oregonian and experience that or a Portlander and then go home and maybe there's a server or a bartender or a song or a chef ready there to walk you through 
in a, in a very similar setting to this on how to prepare that steak or how to cook those veggies or how to mix that cocktail or how to appreciate that wine. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. We really appreciate it. Everyone make sure you check out at your door and the incredible work that Robbie and his team is doing. Um, and if you're interested in any of the cocktails um, that Robbie made tonight, let us know. And we'll follow up with the recipes and you can get your wander back online um, or if you're in Washington and or Oregon, where we're in some stores as well. Um, so again, thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Cody. It was so great to see you guys. Hope you enjoy the rest of your Memorial Day weekend. You as well. Thank you very much for having me. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Have a good one. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye.